Hi everyone, my name is Dr Matt Williams. I'm a tutor in politics here at Jesus College of the University of Oxford. I've been involved with admissions and interviewing for the University of Oxford for about the past 13 years and I want to share with you some of my insights from that process to help you feel more comfortable if you have an interview for Oxford, Cambridge or any university indeed. To my mind there are basically five types of questions that tend to come up in an interview and what these have in common is they give us the academics, the opportunity to gauge your academic potential. And so that raises the question about, well, what does that mean, right? Well, the fundamental difference, as far as I can see it, between school and university is that at school, you're taught knowledge and skills and how to apply them in quite familiar contexts. So you'll have problems and puzzles, but there'll be variations on a theme. At university, you'll just build on that by trying to do the same, but apply your knowledge and your skills to unfamiliar contexts so that ultimately you could be part of the process of generating ideas, generating new knowledge, because that's what universities do. They're kind of factories for ideas and information, and we're looking for innovation. So we look for people who have that sort of raw capacity, not perfectly honed, but that raw capacity to start pushing boundaries, pushing ideas, pushing envelopes. And so in the interview, we will tend to ask questions that will gauge your potential to be involved with that. So that's why primarily interviews at Oxford and Cambridge are not tests of knowledge. We, we'd much rather test how you think for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, acquiring knowledge is somewhat easier than acquiring the skill to use that knowledge. OK, and also we don't know what knowledge you could reasonably be expected to have. We have applicants from 140 odd countries in in Oxford and so we can't necessarily assume oh you would have covered these things in your school syllabus we will for some subjects like maths perhaps assume a certain level of understanding and skill but even there we will tend to push you outside of your normal comfort zone and see how you can apply that knowledge and skill to something unfamiliar okay because ultimately what we're getting at is can you contribute to an academic conversation can you contribute to a conversation where we are trying to apply our ideas and our skills to something new, to something unknown and something unfamiliar, so that ultimately we can develop new, new thinking. Okay, so let's go through them. And what we're going to do is go through the five types of questions in a sort of logical sequence, uh, starting at the very foundations of what it means to have a discipline at a university, all the way up to specific puzzles that we will try and solve. Okay, so beginning at the bottom, if you like, if we rip up the floorboards of any academic discipline, there is the foundations, right, to, to use a sort of building metaphor, right? You've got the foundations of the building. And that is the sort of the understanding of what the discipline is, right? So when we talk about the sort of degrees we offer at Oxford, like history, like English literature, like engineering, what are those disciplines? <laughs> what, are their, what are their parameters? Where do they begin and end? You know, where does sort of maths begin and philosophy end or, you know, that sort of stuff. I often do interviewing for history and politics, one of the degrees we offer here in Oxford. And one of my standard questions for interviewees is what's the difference between history and politics? Because I want to have some sense that you, you know what you're signing yourself up for, right? You've got three years worth of history and politics studying to do. Do you know what the differences are? I'm not looking for a particular answer because I'm not entirely sure what the answer is myself, but I want to get a sense that you've thought about it and that you have some ideas and that you're not just sort of throwing yourself into a subject without having some sense of it. Now, here's an example from English literature of a disciplinary question. So the question is, why isn't Twilight on the English faculty reading list? Why isn't Twilight on the English faculty reading list? Now, let's just be clear. How would you answer this question? Just answer it, right? So in, in the first instance, you just start thinking out aloud, just say what's coming to your mind and answer the question in a very focused, very disciplined way. So use the language of the question to frame your response. For example, well, I think that Twilight is not on the English faculty reading list because, and then you might say something like, it's not good enough, <laughs> right? And that, of course, will lead to the follow-up question of, well, what does good enough mean? And how do we determine what is or is not included in the canon or, you know, the, the great works? And, and the reason this is a disciplinary question is because it's kind of gravitating us towards a deeper subtextual conversation about what is English literature? What do English literature students and faculty do all day? How do they know that they're reading the right things? What if they, through some fit of sort of appalling snobbery, have determined that Stephanie Meyer must be cast out and never read, whereas Shakespeare and Chaucer and other, you know, dead white dudes <laughs> should be prioritised? Now, don't get me wrong, I have to think Shakespeare and Chaucer are amazing. 
haven't honestly read Stephanie Meyer, so I can't comment. But this is a genuinely sort of open-minded intellectual discussion about how we determine quality, because that's the sort of thing that's kind of often assumed or taken for granted, but we need to explicitly understand what are we doing here? Do we know that we're picking the right books for the canon? Or are we maybe making some mistakes? Because that would be really bad, right? So this is a sort of a foundational disciplinary question about what is English? And you can think about how that might apply to any subject that you're applying for as well. You know, do you understand what it means to be a geographer, a psychologist, a, a medical student, right? You, you're not likely to be directly asked about these questions, but if you have a view on it, it will help you understand the nature of the discipline that you're signing up for. Okay. The second type of interview question that's quite common is to do with concepts. So if with the disciplinary questions we ripped up the floorboards and we looked at the foundations of the building, to continue that building metaphor, we're now, you know, we, we've put the floorboards back on, right? And the concepts are kind of like the ground that we, we, we stand on. Concepts are sort of found fundamental, you know, I was about to say foundation again, mix my metaphors or confuse everyone, fundamental sort of uh, ideas that we use uh, to build theories and build other, oh, maybe, I, maybe my metaphor should be there like the bricks. Okay, I'm, I'm really confusing now. Anyway, for my discipline, politics, the core concepts would be things like freedom, justice, democracy, right? These are terms that we use and they have enormous semantic importance. So we pay an awful lot of attention to them. We, we are careful as to how we use them, what we mean by them. Potentially we talk about how we could measure them and, and understand where they begin and where they end. Because if we can't be clear as to the, to the language we're using, then everything else that follows becomes unusable, right? If, if I want to come up with some theory as to why some countries are democracies and some are not, and I don't even define democracy, the whole exercise is completely ruined, basically. Okay? But here's an example of a conceptual question for law students, which is, can you define intellectual property? Okay? Can you define intellectual property? So intellectual property is a, a, a very important concept. Now, again, in the early stages of the interview, just think out loud. Sort of start saying, well, okay, well, what's property? Let's start with that. You know, property is something that you own and that your ownership is recognized somehow. You know, and as you start thinking out loud, the tutors will help you, right? They, they will help you develop your thinking and, and they will help you to move in, in fruitful directions with, with what you're coming up with. You know, it's not, it's not antagonistic, the interview. It's, it's a collaboration to try and come up with solutions to the, to the problem. Okay, so you know, breaking down the question, deconstructing it's a really good way to start. So you could start with property and then you could build on that to, to start describing what you think intellectual property is as distinguished from say material property. You know, property could be a house or a car or a wallet or something. Intellectual property is something you own that is the product of your mind. So it could be a piece of art, it could be a performance, it could be something along those lines. The interviewers will then start to sort of ask, well, how are we clear as to what is and what is not intellectual property? Which of course is a fundamentally important question in law. You know, there, there will ultimately be a lot of disputes that will make their way to courts about who owns the rights to various, say, pieces of music. And at what point is a piece of music a downright copy as opposed to, you know, a homage or sort of merely slightly derivative or inspired by, right? You know, because musicians obviously as an example, come up with their musical ideas, but not in a vacuum, right? <laughs> so they will have been influenced by loads of their predecessors. And you may be aware that there's lots of case law where individual artists have been sued by other artists for, for plagiarism and stealing their intellectual property. And it, it's a bit of a gray area. Now, ultimately, we'll be interested to know how you define intellectual property. Can you define intellectual property is the question, right? So don't be too tempted to sort of say, well, intellectual property is defined by X and Y statute law or case law as this, that or the other. I mean, you can do that if you're aware of it, but it's, it's not the question. The question is, can you define it? You know, how would you tackle this conceptual minefield? So coming back to the building metaphor, uh, we've laid the foundations with our disciplinary questions. Now we've got the ground floor and we've put some fundamental building blocks, which are the concepts, okay? The next level on from that is building theory. So now we're properly sort of building, building walls of our building, right? <laughs> so theory building are, is to do with the stories we tell ourselves. So a theory is a simplified story about some sort of causal mechanism, usually. And 
it's a story in the sense that it's not actually entirely true. Most theories are simplifications of reality simply because we don't have absolute access to reality. The real world is too complicated for our puny minds to deal with. So we come up with a story which helps us get it well enough to live our lives, right? And without planes just dropping out of the sky and terrible things happening. Okay, so the theory building question we've got here is from a past physics interview. And the question is, why did the Titanic uh, initially float and why did it split in two? Okay, so this again is sort of applying stuff that you may be familiar with, applying your knowledge and applying your skills, but in an unfamiliar context. Likely you haven't been asked about why the Titanic split in two before. But you will have done some things if you're applying for physics to do with buoyancy and gravity and other forces that might work on a, on a body. And it's quite likely that you may be asked to write and draw your thinking about this. So you might draw a sort of little version of the Titanic and arrows with the various different forces that are acting on it to demonstrate you understand why the Titanic floated and yet if I chuck a penny into a fountain it sinks, right? You know, the enormous ship versus a tiny little chunk of metal, but one floats and the other sinks. So, you know, that's the, the, the theory part of it. That's explaining the story. Why is it that one enormous thing can float whilst another tiny thing cannot? And then with regards to how it splits it's sort of relatively neatly into two bits, will again be you thinking about the nature of the forces that would have been acting on it and why they may have led to it shearing into two chunks, why it didn't sort of shatter, why it didn't explode, you know, why it didn't sort of have some other degradation, it split, right? And that's the theory, right? That's you telling the story as to why this happened, then that happened, and then finally, in the end, it split into two. Okay, so that's what makes it a theory. And building theory is absolutely fundamental to academic. I'm, I'm saying absolutely fundamental too much, <laughs> but you know, uh, it, it really is, right? So uh, once we've got our, our sense of what the discipline is, and once we've developed our concepts, then telling stories to help us understand the world. I mean, that's, that's how we progress our understanding of things. Um, so it's, it's very, very important. Now, the next level up from that is method. Now, method is to do with how you test your theories. You've got this nice story about the way the world is and, and what have you. And now you've got to go and prove it. Now, we can never sort of satisfactorily prove much in this world, I'm afraid. You know, most of our knowledge is contingent. It's not perfect. But nonetheless, we want to have a sufficiently good method so that another person could repeat the same method and come up with the same answers, and they could be reasonably satisfied with our theory, with our story, that they think, yeah, it kind of, it kind of bears up when compared to the real world. It's not just a story you've cooked up in your mind, it actually kind of reflects the reality. Now, here's an example of a methodological question for medicine, and it goes as follows. How would you measure the weight of your own head? Okay, um, it's a slightly sort of odd question. This is the sort of question that probably ends up getting printed in a newspaper with a headline along the lines of crazy Oxbridge interview question. <laughs> but the, the rationale for a question like this is that it's really good at evaluating how you apply the stuff you know, okay? And how you can maybe be the sort of person that could contribute to creating knowledge in the future, okay? Because method, it again is, is so crucial to the academic process. It's about how we come together as a community of scholars to, to develop and share knowledge. It's, it's so, so important. So, you know, again, start the interview by thinking out loud and the academics will help you out. You might sort of say, well, I guess I could sort of plunk my head on some scales and, <laughs> see, you know, rest them, see how, see how heavy they are. And the academics will start sort of helping you develop your thinking and they'll probably point out some potential problems with your method. But here's the news. No method is perfect, right? We don't have access to absolute truths about the world. Hence why we have to tell these sort of pretty stories that we call theories and we have to come up with methods that are good enough. But we're never going to have you know, complete, indefeasible truth and, and understanding. So the methods will always be, to a greater or lesser extent, flawed. So if the academic says, we, you know, if you rest your head on a scale, it's going to have various problems because, for example, you know, it's still attached to your body and therefore you're holding a lot of the weight. That's not them saying, this is a complete disaster, right? The interview's gone terribly and you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> They're saying, you know, evaluate what you've said. What are the strengths and weaknesses? Because everything, everything in academia has a strength and a weakness. Nothing is perfect, okay? And the academics will know that better than anyone because they will have spent their whole careers trying to get things published and pushed forward where 
the strengths and weaknesses are pointed out to them very plainly. Okay, so you know you might sort of say, well, okay, if I can't rest my head on the scales, I mean maybe we could do something really drastic and, and horrifying, like we could cut our heads off and then plonk them on the scales. Now, I mean obviously that's grim and and you know unrepeatable uh, method, um, but it's also again kind of flawed because. I mean, not wishing to be too gross about it, a lot of the stuff that's inside your head will, will come out. Um, and so then that sort of begs the question as to what you count as the head, right? And so now we're coming back around to a conceptual question. What is the head, right? Where does the head begin and end? Uh, and do we include all of the contents and including the blood and various other sort of bits of spinal fluid and uh, stuff like that? Um, you know, so how can, we, how can we do it? I mean, I suppose you could perhaps try and employ Archimedean principles and dunk your head in a in a bucket of water and weigh the displaced water see if that works uh, but then again of course you know you'll still be your head will still be attached I hope and uh, <laughs> you know depending on the position of your body you might be holding some of the weight back and so on and so forth I mean the, the basic issue with this question is that it's really really hard right it's it seem it at first glance you think this is kind of straightforward i could weigh my own head in this way but as you get into it you notice all of the sort of enormous swirling complexity about it which is just delicious and you know <laughs> academics love that complexity and we'd be looking for someone to share that sort of joy out of being a little bit confused because that's basically what academia is like and that's why it's so different to school at school there is an answer usually and you are just gravitating towards that answer but in university there are answers and you kind of have to work out which are better and which are worse. And the puzzles you'll be dealing with will be quite unfamiliar. Now, the last example somewhat sort of goes against what I've just said, which is just solving puzzles. So there is the fifth type of interview question in Oxford is where you're given a specific puzzle for which there probably is a correct answer. But it's still very much about how you reach that destination that matters. It's the, it's the journey rather than the destination. And it's not about how quickly you solve the puzzle, it's how you explain the stages of your puzzle solving method. So this is another sort of methodological question. But unlike the question with regard to weighing your own head, there is actually a specific answer to this that we are going to help you get to as interviewers. Okay, so the question is, what is the final digit of two to the power 1000? Now, again, start the interview by just thinking out loud. So you can start by perhaps recognizing some of the difficulties with this puzzle that you couldn't easily just sort of tap this into a calculator because the number would be enormous. And it's the sort of thing where using mental arithmetic, it's going to be quite tricky. So then it becomes about, well, how do you get a handle on this puzzle? Now, the tutors will help you again, right? This is, this is a, a teaching moment. The interview isn't isn't antagonistic, it's collaborative, the tutors will help you come up with some viable solutions. But one thing to think about in advance when you're confronted with puzzles like this is how can you make it simple or as simple as possible? So break down this huge problem of two to the power of thousand to something much more straightforward. So for example, you, you must uh, assume that there is a pattern we can discern in a much simpler puzzle that we can then extrapolate out to two to the power thousand. So what's two to the power one, for example? Well, it's, it's two, right? And what's two to the power two? It's four. Two to the power three, eight. Two to the power four, 16. And basically every time you add a new power, you're just doubling the last number. And you're gonna keep going around in a cycle, therefore. And indeed, if you just keep writing down two to the power of x plus 1, you're going to get a, a, a cycle pattern of 2, 4, 8, 6, 2, 4, 8, 6, 2, 4, 8, 6, 2, 4, 8, 6, and it's just going to go on and on and on for forever. So therefore, we can get much closer to what 2 to the power of 1,000 must be. And indeed, you might start to recognize that as a 1,000 can, can be split into 4, 1,000 can be divided evenly into 4 parts of 2. 250, then there must be 250 cycles of the 2486, 2486. And indeed, it will culminate on 2 to the power of 1000 at the end of that cycle. So the last number of 2 to the power of 1000 is going to be 6. And that's the answer. But it's how you get to that answer that matters. And you would need to explain your reasoning to the tutors. You may be asked to write some things down. So all of those little bits of mathematics that I did about 2 to the power 1, 2 to the power 2, you could write that down so you could explain your reasoning. 
And again, it's all just about how you solve a difficult puzzle that is probably unfamiliar to you. All right. So to conclude, there are, to my mind, five types of interview question that will come up at Oxford and Cambridge. And those are going back to my building metaphor, starting with the very foundations. What are we doing here? <laughs> you know, what is history? What is maths? What is geography? What is English literature? How do we know what we're doing? And, and what is it that makes this discipline distinct from another discipline? And then once we've laid over the foundations with the ground floor, we've got some building blocks. And those are the concepts that we talk about. This is the language we use to describe some fundamental phenomena in our field, like intellectual property, like democracy like poverty you know these are terms that we use and we try and use them systematically so that we can understand each other when we have a conversation amongst academics we're speaking the same language and we're not you know talking at odds with each other and then from concepts we then can start building theories we can start telling those stories about the world that can help us unpack and understand a very very complex problem like why the titanic split into two and then from theory we might want to talk about well how can we test those theories right if you came up with a theory as to why the Titanic split in two. What would be your research to, to test that? How could you come up with something that perhaps mocks up the Titanic, Titanic to describe how the forces acted on it such that it would split into two pieces? You know, you're not going to develop a whole huge ocean liner because that would be too expensive <laughs> to prove why it would split in two. So how would you do it? And that sort of sensitivity to how and not just what is really important and really useful. And then finally, there are more specific puzzles to be solved quite often in academia. And then again, it's still kind of about the method. It's about how you reach the destination. It's how you share with other people your solutions to these puzzles. It's not actually that useful in academia if you don't tell people what you're doing, and you don't share with them your approach to things. We are a collaborative enterprise in, in universities. We, we work together to try and solve some of humanity's greatest problems. You know, whether it's climate change or starvation or, or you, you, know, you name it. And we need to work together. So your ability to explain how you solve puzzles is, is absolutely crucial. Okay, so those are the five types of interview question that you tend to get at, at Oxford and Cambridge universities. Let me know your answers to those questions in, in the comments below. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or comments related to interviews and I'll try and answer them. Check out some of the other videos that we have made for this channel on interviews because hopefully they will also be of help and yeah i wish you the best of luck if you're invited to an interview and thank you so much for watching all the best bye now